Hi everyone, welcome to Birthing at Home, a podcast. I'm Elsie, your host. I've had two home births in April 2020 and in June 2023. I'm a mental health nurse and an ex-student midwife that has a strong passion for birth and supporting women. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land I'm recording on in Nam, Melbourne, Australia. I would also like to acknowledge that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples have been birthing at home on country for tens of thousands of years prior to the British invasion and acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. This is the ninth episode and it's our first double home birth story from midwife and hypnobirth educator Jess. Jess is from New Beef, just outside of Brisbane, and in this episode she shares the story of a three-day labour with Teddy in 2019 and the much quicker birth of Renly in 2022, both at home. If you're enjoying the podcast, please read or review it as it really helps it be found in the sea of other podcasts out there and it also means a lot to me. I hope you really love this episode. Welcome, Jess, to the Birthing at Home, a podcast. Thanks for having me, Elsie. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited today to talk to you because you're actually the first uh, guest that I've had so far that has had two home births. Um, So we were just discussing uh, to everybody listening how we're going to break this up. Um, And so I think, Jess, do you want to just start by telling us a little bit about who you are, um, your family, like where you live, etc. For sure. Um, so I am a mum of two boys and a endorsed private midwife and hypnobirthing Australia practitioner. And I live just outside of Brisbane in a little suburb called Newbie. Um, so I have been a midwife for 13 years now and I'd been a midwife for like um, – what's the math, seven years before we planned to fall pregnant. So I had a lot of background experience um, prior to having my first baby and prior to choosing my first um, home birth. Um, yeah. And, yeah, so we, we live on a bit of acreage and we live a really beautiful little home life, home school, home babies, all the things <laughs> at home. Amazing. So you worked for seven years as a midwife before you had your first baby? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and was that only in a hospital environment? Uh, yes, I had worked in a few different settings within the hospital. Um, I worked in the midwifery group practice. I worked in the um, antenatal postnatal ward. I worked in the birthing suite. I worked in bereavement for a few months. Um, and then I finished up... Before I had my firstborn, I finished up working in the correctional center, um, doing continuity of care for the women in the corrections. So kind of been a bit everywhere. Oh, and I did some work in the um, birthing center as well in the early days. So (laughs) a bit of everything. Yeah, Yeah, cool. I um, work in forensics. I don't work with uh, adults, but Mm -hmm. um, that's funny. What a weird connection. Um, (laughs) What can you tell me? I don't really understand when you say that you're an endorsed do you say an endorsed yeah. private midwife? What does that mean? So an endorsement is a qualification um, or a label, I suppose, you can put to being a registered mid- midwife. So endorsement means that we have a Medicare provider number, uh, we work in private practice and are endorsed to prescribe uh, scheduled medicines. So it gives yeah. us a few additional um, yeah, okay. skills. Skills yeah. or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. And um, you're a hypnobirth pr- practitioner? Yeah, so I teach the yeah. Hypnobirthing Australia program as well as um, my own uh, birth classes and um, yeah. practitioner classes. So I teach midwives and doulas skills to support physiological birth. Um, yeah. So I've been doing that for 10 years now, which is really awesome. Oh, wow. So you um, came into like this whole home birth world like with already knowing the skills of hypnobirthing basically. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's amazing. So was hypnobirthing kind of where, like, had had you known about home birth before you had Mm. kind of begun that hypnobirthing journey? Yes, I did. So I was very privileged as a student midwife to um, 
my first exposure to like real birth was with a lecturer that came from the UK who was a home birth midwife who really trusted in birth and so the way that she taught us had this beautiful foundation in birth physiology and trusting birth and understanding that birthing at home is the norm (laughs) for so many women so when we then trained in the hospital it's looking at it through that lens so I was really privileged to have that kind of as my first introduction to how birth works before then setting foot in the institution um and I had planned to be a home birth midwife um early in my career uh and then just seeing that birth worked very differently within the hospital setting is why I branched out into hypnobirthing so I wanted to be able to educate women um, through an independent you know outsourced program um, to help them prepare for birth because it wasn't something that uh, I was seeing easily achieved in the setting that I worked in yeah that's amazing good for you go like go you like that's fantastic (laughs) juggling Um, all the plates you know (laughs) yeah all of all of the things that's very cool um okay so do you want to tell us about um your first birth at home then so that was in 2019 I think you said before yes um so our first baby was (laughs) pre-pandemic yeah Um, just (laughs) just (laughs) So uh, I was still working at the hospital um, throughout my pregnancy. I finished up at 35 weeks there. I wanted to give myself um, plenty of time to kind of put myself into that home birth mindset and prepare for birthing at home Um, because most days I was coming up across like, you know, some issues with my colleagues or just a fundamental difference in opinion about how birth works and what's best and safest for me and my baby um, as if anyone else really got a say. And so I felt like it was really important to be able to take a step back away from um, that kind of setting and deep dive into home birth preparation. Um, There was a lot of mental work through the pregnancy in, you know, trusting that, my body and baby really knew what to do and that we weren't going to, um, you know, kind of, uh, what's the best way to describe it? There's this, this phenomenon, (laughs) um, in midwives that work in a hospital that, um, many of them believe there's this curse of midwife birth that if you're a midwife, you're, uh, doomed to have a really complicated intervention, heavy birth just because you're a midwife and that's very uh, heavy yeah it was really really heavy and so a lot of our emotional work was kind of saying that doesn't have to be true because of our understanding of hypnobirthing and birth physiology we understand that a lot of complications that surround birth a lot of interventions that surround birth stem from the fear and misunderstanding of birth itself so if you can step into birth with a really solid knowledge base, with good support, with a safe environment that's emotional and physically safe, then then birth works, you know. So it was really leaning into that trust that some of the things that you see within the hospital setting don't have to apply to you. And the question I was constantly coming up with for myself is, is this relevant and is this helpful? Because yes, it's real. Like we saw a lot of trauma. We saw a lot of complicated things. We saw the rare incidences that come up medically. Um, but is that relevant to me and my circumstances and what I have to bring to my birth? And is it helpful, um, to focus on those kind of things? So there was a lot of emotional work before my birthing. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Well, they, they say, um, like a, yeah, like a similar thing about obstetricians that, mm. you know, obstetricians are trained in complications. So mm. when you're trained in complications, you're trained to see the complications. So you see all the complications and you don't actually see the, you know, when it doesn't go wrong, you know, That's and then exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. And we so, know about iatrogenic, you know, intervention as well as the things that we do that cause the cascade of interventions. So, it's going into birth saying, well, if I choose this and this and this, then most likely I'll be able to avoid this and this and this. And obviously there's those rare circumstances in life that you just cannot avoid. Um, But 
there is a large amount of preparation that goes into supporting birth. So I did everything that I could and I kept just coming back to if something happens that's out of my control, I know that I have done everything within my ability to support my birth physiology. So if a true variation comes up that I have to manage, then I've got the skill set to deal with that. Um, But the most likelihood is that it won't actually um, go down that route, that most likely things will be straightforward and my midwives are highly trained and um, that's what the skill set is for if there is an emergency at home. So there was a lot of preparation Mm -hmm. in just saying, actually, I've got everything I need and birth is safest at home um, for me and my baby. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, Wow. That's like very heavy to like have to, uh, yeah, I had no idea that there was like this curse of the midwife Mm. or whatever. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Wow. So you finish at 35 weeks Yeah. and had you had a like fairly uncomplicated pregnancy or yeah like um clinically my pregnancy was really simple I didn't have any major morning sickness I didn't have any issues medically I was comfortable I was happy um so yeah I was really good um and I was very comfortable with thinking you know my baby's probably going to arrive somewhere between 37 and 42 weeks and most likely after 40 weeks and I was just happy to be pregnant and I was happy to be on the journey and so I was happy to be patient (laughs) and my baby was um well also very happy to make me be patient um (laughs) we got to 41 weeks and four days and my midwives Uh, had that inevitable conversation about like what do you want to do I was very clear up until that point like I'm not talking about induction I don't want any unnecessary intervention I don't want to talk about this at all and when we got to that point they were kind of like look you don't have to commit to anything but we do need to talk about it (laughs) um And I realized how much I had been holding on to the fear that I wouldn't go into labor and that I'd have to, quote unquote, have to have an induction and that my home birth would be taken away from me and I'd have to go to the hospital and all the obstetricians would say, I told you so. And I just like had played out this horrible scenario in my head and I was really holding on to that um, level of control that I think a lot of first time moms have that you like think you can control what's about to happen and you can't. Um, so we did a big fear release. I cried for two hours and my my midwives gave me the permission to not decide. And I think that was all I needed was to say, actually, there isn't a time frame where you have to do anything, have to underline bold italics doesn't exist. You get to choose. Our job is to give you the information. Your job is to make the decision. We support you. And those magical words of like, we support you no matter what you want to do was like a weight lifted off my shoulders because I'd worked in an environment where that wasn't really the case, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So it was such a blessing. And then I went home and I felt lighter and I was like, it's going to be okay. We have a plan to like, you know, just see what happens. Um, and if I decide to change my mind and at any point I decide that I'm done, we can go talk about the induction then, but we don't have to talk about it now. And because I wasn't carrying that burden around, I went into labor that night. <laughs> so that was the start of my birth journey. <laughs> Yeah. So between 35 and 41 plus four, mm-hmm. um, you know, I guess working on your mindset and stuff, had you been preparing in other like ways, like mentally, physically, like mm. what did you, what did you get up to? Uh, so I was, you know, going and doing yoga, um, twice a week and walking every day. And I just like, really like being in nature. So I spent a lot of time just out in nature and quite a bit of time barefoot. Um, I was doing the typical, like drinking raspberry leaf tea and, yeah. um, eating dates with peanut butter I and dates. Yeah. I love my dates and, um, yeah. doing some, uh, optimal maternal positioning. So I was doing daily, um, circuits to help balance my pelvis. Um, seeing a chiropractor and an acupuncturist um, and a naturopath. And so I was kind of like holistically doing all the things and regularly doing my hypnobirthing practice every night um, to help 
just feel super excited about birth and I was really excited and I didn't feel any pressure and I wasn't doing any of those things in order to like put myself into labor I felt like no pressure to make myself go into labor at all um all of the things I was doing was mostly with the goal of create space for the baby help to um optimize my position for their position and give myself every evidence-based chance to support this labor to do what it needs to do Um, but it wasn't until that 41 week and four days mark that I kind of felt the panic a little bit of like oh no what if what if I'm that one like that doesn't go into labor what if it doesn't work what if you know I am the lemon (laughs) and there was a lot of like those fears that I'd pushed down that I'd ignored for a really long time that kind of came bubbling up on that day yeah so yeah, I acknowledged yeah, yeah. them and I let them go and that's what I actually needed to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and tell me, so um, the people around you, I guess mm. your partner or like family, what were their kind of feelings about home births? Uh, do you know? Yes, I do. <laughs> we have a very open family. Um, my mother – um, is very supportive of me and um, she had herself she had three cesareans so I was a breech baby her first child and um, she had a cesarean for me and then yeah. she had a caesar for my brother who was um, 4.6 kilos um, yeah. and then she had a cesarean for my youngest brother because you know <laughs> Yeah. Um, if you've and had two, then yeah, it's a slip. Once a Caesar, always a Caesar, they used to say. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so there was a lot of, um, I think I was very protective um, of my decision. I was very fight or flight about it. And I felt like if anyone had anything to say, I was going to shut them down. So I was really, I'm yep. a very opinion, opinionated human. And so they trusted me. They were like, look, dude, this is your specialty. This is your profession. If anyone's going to know how to make an informed choice, it's going to be you. So you do it. You got it. Um, we're going to be here uh, biting our nails if need be, but they, they very yeah. much kept it to themselves. Um, yeah. My husband, um, he had, complete faith in me um probably even more than I had at times he was just so chill he's like you want to have a baby at home you have the baby at home and you're going to do perfectly and you don't need anyone's help and I'm just going to be here and it's going to be awesome so he was really excited (laughs) to just do the thing and he didn't want to go to hospital he didn't want to be around people he didn't know he didn't want to leave our environment so it suited him perfectly to just be there and it makes perfect sense you know yeah 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 he was on board. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not um, just the, you know, when you when you go to hospital to have a, a birth in a hospital, it, it's not just you going. It's, it's mm. your support person. It's your partner. It's, yeah, yeah. it's everyone. We're, they're all going along for the ride. And, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I agree. It's just it's nicer yeah. for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, so it, it's – so you have your two-hour cry. It's very <laughs> – So cathartic. <laughs> And releasing, which yeah. sounds amazing. Um, and then you go home, you're 41 plus four. Mm-hmm. What happens? So I had dinner. I watched a movie. I yeah. went to bed. Um, so my husband was doing like nightly um, massage and aromatherapy. And yeah. um, we listened to a script. So we just did our routine. We did, went to bed. Yeah. And I woke up at one in the morning um, having surges and they were probably like 10 minutes apart so not really bothering me but I was a bit uncomfortable my typical go-to with like my menstrual cycle is a lot of back ache um and a lot of pulling so I was feeling a lot of that and I was just excited I'm like oh yay (laughs) it's gonna happen um and yeah so it kind of like progressed a little bit throughout the night um and I was feeling quite uncomfortable, so I went and had a shower while my husband slept. And I um, 
was feeling a lot of pressure. So I sneakily kind of like was like, oh, I'll just do like my own internal and just prove to myself what's going on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I did. I, ch- I checked what my cervix was doing. I was just so damn excited because it was fully effaced and I was one centimeter dilated. And although like I know a lot of people would be really disheartened to feel like they were doing a lot of work and only one centimeter, but I was so excited that my cervix had thinned out in that amount yeah. of time. Yeah, because so it doesn't just have like, to just go, like, like, there's just so much that has to happen. It's not yes. like simpler, like, one centimetre, two centimetre, three. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so, quite impressed that you managed to do it yourself. I mean, you obviously have <laughs> years and years and years of experience, but yeah. I have tried to do that. And with a massive belly, it's – it was real hard. Was I real remember hard. the flexibility involved in it. I was yeah. um, <laughs> kind of kneeling in the shower um, at the yeah. time. And, yeah. you know, granted, my cervix had moved forward and was really low, so it was helping yeah, <laughs> to yeah, be yeah, found. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, like just being able to kind of so clearly be like, oh, my God, I can feel my baby's head through that little opening of the cervix. And I was just elated. I was so excited. I didn't care how long this process was going to be. I was just excited that it was actually happening and I didn't need to talk about having an induction. Um, So that was good. Um, And then things Mm -hmm. kind of like were just, you know, they slowed down. For me, I'm really um, susceptible to the melatonin cycle. Like, Like the sun comes up, I'm awake. It doesn't matter if I've done night shifts. It doesn't matter what's been going on. Like sun's up, I'm up. So that's pretty much what happened. Like the sun came up and it was winter. So it was like six o'clock or so that it started getting light and my surges really spaced out. So they just kind of stayed at like one in 10, one in 15 all day. And I was like, that's fine. And the night came that night. It started to intensify again. I was doing like three in 10 and was working a bit harder with it and was still fairly comfortable. I just had the tens machine on and was trying to rest as much as possible. Um, but the next morning, the same thing happened. Things slowed down and spaced out again. Um, so at this point we're now, um, 41 plus five. 41 and six. 41 so like, and six. Yeah. So my labor started oh, wow. at 1am at 41 and five. Um, yeah. so I did the whole day again, one in 10, things slowed down. And my midwife came to do like an early labor, just check in, sit with me, see how things were going emotionally. Baby and I were physically perfectly fine. Um, But we did know, we identified that, yes, baby is posterior and is hanging out posterior and needs um, some more space, I think. So we actively started doing techniques, um, to support that um we were doing inversions off the side of the bed we were doing rebozo sifting um we were doing abdominal lift and tuck and we eventually also did a modified Walch's maneuver to help get that head to flex um so we were kind of doing all sorts of weird and wonderful techniques yeah um that I teach so (laughs) I do love that I got to experience every single technique that I teach (laughs) firsthand so I can really talk about how it feels now (laughs) Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so, yeah, we were working through that and comfortably. Like, I was really comfortable and I was just patient. I kept repeating, like, position over progress. It doesn't matter how long this takes. My baby and I are healthy and we are comfortable and we are fine. We just need to help make the space for baby to turn and navig- uh, navigate the pelvis. So he rotated yeah. the long way around. <laughs> yeah. And then when he got to um, the left anterior, it was just like a switch flicked and my surges were like suddenly really strong, regular. I was shaking. I had like an adrenaline hit because his head suddenly went really low into the pelvis and was um, on my cervix and I went deep into labor land at that point. So it was just all of a sudden that I was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this now (laughs) wow Um, yeah and I felt this agitation because I needed my midwives there at that point and it was probably like 3 p.m and they had said we're going to come back at 4 p.m to check on you so in my head I knew they were coming and this anticipation of knowing they were coming was almost like my body was like okay they'll be here soon you can really sink into it and then things started actually happening um when they got there uh I don't remember ever acknowledging their presence so they walked in yeah, and I heard yeah. her say like how long has she been like this <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah 
Um, and yeah, so they filled up the birth pool at that point for me. It took ages, like so long, um, to get the pool filled up. And as soon as they kind of said like, Hey, do you want to get in the pool? It was like, yes, but like 10 minutes ago. (laughs) <laughs> now that you've said it, I feel like I needed to be in there 10 minutes ago. So it took 45 yeah. minutes to get the pool filled up. And, you know, that that was probably the hardest part. <laughs> Just yeah, waiting. yeah, 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 yeah. I needed that 10 minutes yeah. ago. <laughs> oh, it's 10 um, minutes late. Yeah. Oh, and that sensation. Of- so, yeah, I, I jumped in the, the birth pool and... Um, oh, my gosh, like that sensation just sinking into the warm water was just bliss. It was so good. Just everything felt yeah. so nice. And every aching muscle I had from being awake for three days was just gone. And I just rested and felt so nice. And my surges did space out a little bit, um, yeah. but they were still strong and, and regular. And so, yeah, we were just going from like in the pool, changing positions back and forth instinctively. Um, and then I'd get out. Um, every hour or so and go to the toilet or hop in the shower for a bit while they warmed the pool back up and we just kind of went back and forth from there um I was doing some like lunges with my partner rocking back and forth um creating space and everything was just really intuitive like I look back on it and I'm like oh yeah I can see where the baby was at in my pelvis at that time based on what I was doing but I didn't I wasn't being told any of that it just was happening because it felt right yeah um yeah 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 so it was really good. And then I hit um, transition at like 11.30 p.m. So it's yeah. been a, a while. Wow, you must have been exhausted. I I was, but like I also wasn't. Like yeah. um, tired was probably the hardest like in sensation. That, in like that transition, I think um, – uh, oh gosh, I forget which hormones like or something rises mm. like beta ador- endorphins or something, and like that's when you are like slipping in and out of like a little micro nap. Is that correct? Does that sound correct? Yeah. So like, um, we're getting really beautiful flow of beta endorphins throughout the labor, which is giving us that yeah. pain relief and that kind of labor land uh, euphoria. Yeah, labor land. And then I love you- how you call it labor land. <laughs> That's you, great. It really is. But actually to touch on that is you think you're fully present. Like I remember thinking so much throughout my labor, like this little monologue in my head and thinking, yeah. is this transition? Is this transition? Like I vomited at some point and I was like mathematically in my head being like, hmm, these look like transition type behaviors, but I don't feel like I'm close <laughs> enough. My baby's definitely not low enough. So therefore I'm not actually transitional. And so like I remember yeah. thinking really logical things, but – when I listen to my birth story, I'm like, oh, that wasn't a really logical thing to think because that doesn't really fit yeah. that scenario. So it feels like you're perfectly there, but then yeah. you're not because all of those neurons aren't really connecting the dots perfectly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So my transition actually looked like a big flood of doubt, like a bit of a crisis of confidence, and it was so internalized. Like my midwife and my partner – They've said from their point of view, I was chill as a bean. Like I was just riding the waves beautifully. I was so quiet. I was so calm. What was going on in my head was like, oh my God, I'm so freaking tired. This baby is never going to come out of me. I bet I'm obstructing. I'm going to have to go to hospital. They're going to give me an epidural. I bet I'll end up having a failed forceps and then I'll have a Caesar and it'll be awful. And that midwife's curse again. It was really bubbling up. <laughs> yeah. So I was sitting wow, in the shower at that point having all these thoughts and I've got this incredible photo that um, one of my midwife friends came to photograph our birth. She arrived at that point when I was transitioning and she's taken a photo and I've just got my head on the shower um, handle and just like, you know, it looks like I'm just going, what the heck? (laughs) And I love that photo because I know exactly what I was thinking in that moment was, yeah, this is the make or break it. Like, I think if I'm not progressing, I'm just going to have to go to hospital. Like, how long can I possibly be here and just not have a baby? And that doubt yeah. kind of came up. And I looked at my midwife and I said, I think I need a VE or a vaginal exam. And she was like, why? <laughs> like, <laughs> she was so taken aback um, because I had, you know, I didn't want any. Yeah, and yeah. so she was like, why? What's going on? And I was like, look, I can feel his hand. He's probably like malpositioned. I reckon I'm obstructing. Like, I just need you to know. Cause like, if I'm, if I'm six centimeters, this is just not going to happen. Right. And it was all fear talking. Like that's not super yeah, logical. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> but yeah, yeah, she yeah. went and chatted with the second midwife who um, had a lot more home birth experience was like, what do we do? Jess is like adamant that she's obstructing. Like, do we trust her or is she freaking out? Like, what do we do? And they ultimately said like, let's just do it. Let's do the VE. We won't tell her what her cervix is up to as per her request, but we can give her some information, reassurance, and just tell her she's fine, right? Because that's all she needs to know. She's fine. So they agreed to do the VE. And I know from my notes and chatting with them afterwards that I was like nine centimeters at the time. Um, yep. But what they said at that point was, baby's in a great position. Baby's moving down. You are doing so good. You can love keep it. going, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was transitioning, so my brain was like, well, that obviously means I'm not fully dilated, so uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah, going to yeah, go yeah, yeah. and sulk on the toilet for a while. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I went yeah, and yeah. sat on the toilet, and I kind of just like, pull yourself together, Jess. You're doing fine. If they're not concerned, then there's nothing to be concerned about. So go have a rest and keep going. So I, I crawled like physically on my hands and knees, back to the bed, crawled into the bed and said, (laughs) go away, I'm going to sleep. And then I did. I went to sleep. (laughs) Wow. Um, And they all knew I was transitioning. So I love that. My husband, my two midwives, my birth photographer, midwife friend, were all just like, oh, look at that, bless. (laughs) She's going to go have a sleep. Okay. So they're rubbing aromatherapy into the acupressure points on my feet. They were doing light touch massage. They curled me up into a nice little um, sideline release. And they said, off you go, have a sleep. We're here for you. And I slept for probably 15 minutes and then woke up mid-surge and was bearing down. And I was like, oh, my God. Did everyone see that? Like, I was pushing. I was so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so they said after a couple of surges like that, they were like, all right, um, you said you wanted to earth in the water. Do you want to go back to the water? And I was like, yes, please, let's do that. Um, so I duck walked back down to the pool, climbed back into the pool, and um, continued bearing down there. It was just so – I was so happy. I was yeah. not in pain. I was – um, calm. I was smiling. I was really present because of that wonderful adrenaline hit of <laughs> transition. Yeah. And was just like, yeah. yay, like the baby's going to come out. Like this is it. This is the, the end, right? Yeah. Um, it felt like maybe only 15 minutes, but I know it was an hour and a half of bearing down and we were changing wow. positions and we went back to the toilet at one point to help him descend a bit further. Yeah. Um, in hindsight, this all makes perfect sense because he was so wrapped up in his cord and it was a really short cord. So he was essentially yeah. bungee jumping. Like every time I would bear down, he'd come oh. all the way down. You could see this beautiful little pale head and then he'd go all the way back up. Bounce all the way back up. Mm. No. But, you know, at the time I was like, I I was like, whatever, like he feels like he's coming all the way down. This is great. I didn't really think about it. It's only in hindsight that I'm like, oh, right. Of course he was doing that. Yeah. 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 Um, The only bugbear I had in my entire labor experience was at one point someone said to me like, can you just hold that push? Just keep him there a little bit. And I remember thinking like, try, like I'm like trying my best. I can't, I can't possibly do any better than this and yeah. I can't force this any harder. Like he's going to only yeah. come to there if he's only coming to there. I don't know what else I could possibly do. Um, yeah. And then my body kind of just took over and did like a couple of really strong surges one after another and he got to crowning and then just projectiled out. Like from crowning it was just wow. blah, 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 rested the baby um, yeah. all wrapped up in this – little tiny cord um like crossed over his back and around his leg and I unraveled him underwater um and I think at that point like his feet were still like inside of me because his cord was so short he couldn't come all the way out so we unraveled him underwater and then brought him up and I was just like I just did that thing I just did the thing (laughs) that I said I was gonna do you know (laughs) like yeah my baby came out of my vagina at home (laughs) yeah (gasps) So wow. it's amazing. And I was like, you know, I felt like I had just won the biggest trophy. I was like, I did it and I proved yeah. you all wrong, which I know is not the goal, but I felt no, pretty damn proud of myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that is incredible because like, yeah, you can focus on like, oh, like it's 
um, such a short cord wrapped around, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, but I guess, yeah, although, although, you know, you've said that you were having like these internal like crisis of confidence kind of things, like mm. when you trust that your body has made the baby and has done what it needs to do to get to this point, like I think – like short or long, like that mm. baby's going to come out. Absolutely. Like, and we know physiologically that works. Like there's no such yeah. thing as like, oh, no, <laughs> like it's just not going to come out. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, crap. changes the, the pattern, right? too short. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. it's like this really, really impacted my practice as a midwife. Like I already knew all of these things. But to then yeah. be like, this is really proof of like how wrong we get it in the hospital because despite having a really beautiful skill set, despite having knowledge, despite having the belief in women, you're constantly undermined by the policies that say, but you only have this much time. And if the pattern doesn't look like that, then it's wrong. And we have to do X, Y, Z to make it fit the pattern that we need yeah. for the partogram. Yeah. Because my labor with Teddy – would have been pathologized in the hospital. I would have been recommended at least a bunch of interventions to speed it up or I would have been told to go home or I would have been, um, you know, advised to have syntocinin or advised to have an epidural, which could have led to more issues because I wouldn't have been able to help him turn the way that I did. My bearing down phase was a bit longer. And again, that would have been like, oh, you know, you're going to need to give it more or he's not going to come out. And so I know how different that would have looked yeah. in that setting. And to to then live that and say all of the things that I did couldn't have changed his position, didn't change how long my labor was going to be, but having the support network that I had, having the comfort of my own home, not having anyone rush me at all. At no point did I ever feel like I was taking too long or being a hindrance or that I had to hurry up or they were going to do interventions. That was everything I needed because when I looked up for reassurance, when I was having those crisis of confidence moments, everyone was looking at me with full trust that I was doing it and that I was fine. And so I didn't look up and see anyone concerned or anyone being irritated or kind of whispering about what they were going to do next there was nothing like that it was just like you're doing great so yeah I was able to kind of go those feelings are there they're real but they're not really relevant because no one else is scared (laughs) yeah 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 but it's like very individualized woman-centered care that we're Mm -hmm. all taught to do Mm -hmm. (laughs) but the hospital uh like you know the, the more medical system um yeah, wants to put everybody in these nice little boxes that yeah. make sense and that, yeah. you know, yeah, follow the policy and yeah. doesn't stray from, you know, the line or the path. But yeah. yeah. So how long how long roughly were you in labor with Teddy? So I always say three days because that's how long I was working for um, and having yeah, yeah, surges yeah. for. But if you want to use like the very traditional definitions of labor progress, then it yeah. was 11 hours and 45 minutes from when yeah. I felt that labor was really progressing to when he was born plus the placenta, which was about 20 minutes after his birth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, a very normal length of labor for a first time mom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for the first time, even yeah, the the gestation um, mm. of forty one plus six or whatever. Well, so forty two plus one when he was yeah forty two plus one at at mm. this stage. Um, <laughs> yeah, all normal and beautiful. Yeah. Um, and yeah, did you tear? Do no you tears. Um, yeah, well, I was going to say, because it, it took so long, your body mm. knew what it was doing. Mm. And even, um, like, going, like, from crowning to baby out so quickly from that point, like, yeah. it had stretched beautifully. Um, yeah. It was, yeah, fantastic. I Power remember the pinchy of feeling of it stretching, but, geez, like, it was yeah. totally fine. Um, yeah. Bleeding was normal. Um, yeah. And the placenta – came out fine. I did consent to synthetic oxytocin um, 20 minutes after the the birth because um, my midwives had some concern that I may have bled a bit more heavily. Um, But when we processed that, we realized we'd all kind of 
uh, overreacted a little bit. We, I had kicked a towel out from under me in the pool, which spread some blood and the towel at the same time. And it looked like oh, I gushed wow. quite yeah. a bit of blood. But um, when we actually kind of slowed down a little bit, we were like, oh, look, actually, that wasn't the case. I'm not bleeding heavily. Yeah. But we kind yeah. of went, hey, in the interest of not, <laughs> let's just do the same. Yeah. In hindsight, I'm like, oh, you know, I may not have made the same choice again, but I'm, I'm happy that I made that choice with the information I had at the time. So yeah. it was okay. Yeah, and that's that's the, all anyone can do. Like yeah. nobody's – like if you don't have all of the pieces of the puzzle, then how yeah. can you be expected to put the puzzle together? Yeah, exactly. Like, I was asked. Yeah. I was – I was informed. I knew about my options. They didn't do yeah. active management of the placenta. Um, yeah. I stood up after they gave me the injection. I went and sat on the toilet and it just went into a yeah. pan in the toilet, still attached to my baby. Um, yeah. We cut the cord like an hour and a half later. So it was yeah. still yeah. not rushed or anything. Um, I'm not yeah. a huge fan of needles, so I wasn't super impressed about getting one. But that was yeah. actually yeah, the yeah. worst part of my whole labor was getting an injection in my leg. <laughs> So yeah, can't yeah. complain. Um, yeah, they're not super fun. Yeah. Um, wow. So then, um, so after Teddy, mm-hmm. you, I guess, pro- yeah, that's amazing. I think that you were able to reflect with your midwives on, you know, the the delivery of the placenta because number one I feel like the placenta is often forgotten about yeah. it's kind of like oh you've given birth well yeah let's, let's just get it out so we can mm-hmm. get on with things mm-hmm. um but number two like how often do women get to go back with their care team uh-huh. and process and reflect on the experience that's, you know, occurred, whether that positive, negative, both, mm. um, you know, I think that's that's really special. That's it is. very unique as well to, I guess, home births or like having private midwives. Yes. Um, I was going to say anyone with continuity of care providers should have that opportunity to sit down and debrief um, all of their births, positive, yeah. negative, whatever it comes up, um, and – to focus only on the woman's interpretation of it. That's such a huge yeah. thing. It's like it doesn't really matter what your intent was, <laughs> um, yeah. only how she interpreted it at the time. So it's always with that reflection in mind is like, hey, wh- what was your perception of what was happening there? Um, we can always yeah. give more insight clinically to say like, oh, this is what we were seeing. But, um, yeah, that's a really beautiful gift to be able to have that and to go yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it must have been so good that you went for round two. <laughs> oh, absolutely. There was no question in my mind that I'm going to just keep having home births. Like I've always yeah. said, <laughs> if I didn't have to raise them, um, that's the hard part is the raising yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then I'd birth 100 babies. Uh, yeah. But we might limit it to like three or four. We'll just see how we yeah. go. <laughs> but you never know. Yeah. It might get easier. <laughs> I don't think so, though. Um, um, what's baby number two's name? Renly. Renly. What's yeah. your name? So he um, was well thought of and planned, but um, – we didn't expect to conceive quite so quickly. It was literally first go. Um, yeah. So <laughs> much to my husband's um, <laughs> displeasure. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, we conceived him, um, contacted our midwives like, um, what, 10 days post-ovulation. She I was going to say them. it's quite a different experience, I suppose, Um like having a, a baby pre-COVID when, mm. you know, you know we know that like um, during COVID, post-COVID, there's been mm. a spike in home birth. Mm. So, yeah, like h- how soon did you contact the midwives, do you reckon, with Teddy? Oh, well, same. Um, it was yeah. three weeks and six days, so we hadn't even like missed the period yet. <laughs> yeah, 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 and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we had been trying for three months to fall pregnant, so not a long time. Um, we'd already yeah. pre-chatted with those midwives as well to say like, we want you. 
Um, so make yeah. sure that you <laughs> keep a spot for us. Be available. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they would never say no to me, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like these are like my friends, colleagues, as well as yeah. the local homeowners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we so actually went with different days. midwives um, with Renly. Okay. Not because of any issue we had, um, but we changed location. We moved and we're further away. Um, yeah. And the midwives, both of the midwives we had for Teddy's birth, weren't there anymore. So one of them went back to um, the hospital and the other one retired. So um, yeah. we were like, okay, no problem. Um, yeah. So as fate would have it, the midwife we chose for Renly's pregnancy and birth was the midwife that taught me midwifery, um, the beautiful oh, home birth midwife from the UK. Um, oh, my gosh. So it was fantastic. And I have so much respect for her um and it was yeah just exactly what we needed so just as our first midwives are exactly what we needed in unlearning some of the systemic stuff that comes with working in a hospital um our second midwives were exactly what we needed for going deeper into you are the full sovereign authority here whatever you want there is literally no requirements of you do you want to do it do you not want to do it it's an opt-in kind of service. So you choose what you want. And so much of the focus through that pregnancy was just on preparing me for having the second baby because my whole yeah. world was about Teddy. Everything was about him. And I just could not picture, like, how am I going to love a second baby equally? Is it going to be okay for Teddy? Um, how am I going to juggle two? What's a home birth with a baby there already going to be like? Like, is he going to be fine so a lot of our preparation was actually for him like telling him about birth and he's got the privilege of being a hypnobirthing midwife's son so he has already seen yeah. hundreds of birth videos and he was always in my classes I would breastfeed during class so he he's heard it all um but he's yeah, yeah, yeah. very involved in our care very involved yeah yeah um, that's amazing so yeah, I mean straight away. that's that's very cool that Teddy could come along. I mean, if you're teaching the class, I guess you yeah. make the rules on who comes to the class. So Exactly. I'm very, very family very centered. Cool. <laughs> so Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's all it's all about these little people and I've always said like you know, you attract the right people into your life. So all of my clients that have come to class and work with me are very open to that and um, learn a lot about parenting from watching me do it while I work and I think more of our society needs to have that flexibility to have children alongside work where possible yeah you know um they don't need yeah to especially especially separate. with breastfeeding as well mm, yeah yeah um so I was still breastfeeding him throughout pregnancy I did end up stopping because of aversions at 28 weeks um yep which was a super emotional journey for me. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, like there's really nothing eventful I need to say about Renly's pregnancy. It was just so chill. Everything was so yeah. chill. Um, there was COVID lockdowns. Our midwife got COVID. Um, there was a huge flood and they couldn't make it to our house. Um, our photographer got sick. And then my second midwife's daughter was in hospital all around the time I was due. So there was a lot of like, well, maybe no one's coming. I don't know. Like I might yeah. not have midwives or a photographer or anything, um, but the baby yeah. will come out of me and it will still be fine regardless. And yeah. having like, I think that was such a beautiful gift to actually have so much trust in myself and my baby and my body to be like, whatever. Like if nobody comes, then that will be fine. And fine. if they come, yeah. that'll be awesome. And if there's a flood, I'll still be fine. Like it just really yeah. wasn't reliant on anyone outside of myself. I had plenty of confidence that it was going to be okay and I couldn't control any of those circumstances. So I just went with it, you know. Had you returned to work from having Teddy um, when you were pregnant with Renly? Or like work well, was, in whatever like pa like paid like employment, I guess? Yeah, so I was working in my private business as a – hypnobirthing educator I yeah. hadn't returned to clinical work as a midwife and yeah I very actively chose not to go back to the hospital when I um finished my paid maternity leave with Teddy I resigned um that was all yeah. pre 
COVID mandates. Um, but yep. that definitely kind of consolidated my, my decision. Um, yep. Yep. So we, I was just working in hypnobirthing at the time um, with Ren. And I finished yep. up my classes just like at 36 weeks. So I worked yep. right up until the end with him. Um, yep. And then I got COVID at 38 weeks. And Excellent. Was sick for Love a little it. bit. <laughs> fine though. Between everybody else getting COVID and floods and the photographer yeah. getting sick and just throw you getting COVID in there. Excellent. Yeah, it is what it is, hey. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, like it was actually really fine. Like I, I was unwell and I had a really high yeah. heart rate for about 24 hours and I was dehydrated and I felt rotten. And then the next day I just had a bit of a cold and the next day I was okay. Um, So it didn't linger. It wasn't particularly bad Um, and definitely not the worst flu I've ever had. Um, So then I just got back to it and was just like, cool, like we'll just wait for the baby. Um, I had a bit in my mind about like, well, maybe I just like, will be like one of those people that gestates longer. Like, am I going to go to 42 weeks again? Um, or was that mostly because of Teddy's position or because of the emotions I was hanging on to? So there was a little bit of like uncertainty about when it might happen, what would be normal for me. Um, yeah. But again, there wasn't any worry about it. It was just going to be what it was. Um, and then at 40 weeks and um, – four days I went and had a massage and a facial and we went and had lunch at the beach and it was a really beautiful family day and I went home yeah. and I went to sleep and I woke up at midnight again um, having surges yeah so yeah. Uh, middle of the night um I got out of bed because I didn't want to wake Teddy up because um, he was still co-sleeping or is still co-sleeping with us um yeah, beautiful so I went and chilled out in the lounge room with my fairy lights and watched some um RuPaul's Drag Race and Excellent. put my TENS machine on and my husband was um, playing games on his computer in the front room so I didn't disturb him um, but just as yep. he was like kind of ready to go to bed he was like oh, I'm really tired I'm gonna go sleep I was like actually I think I really need your support um, <laughs> yep. can you stay with me um, yep. I told him he was gonna regret that I did tell him that he shouldn't be staying up until one in the morning playing games, but he was warned. Yeah. yeah. So if exactly. he's tired, that is his own problem. Was my <laughs> yeah. reasoning. Um, exactly. But yeah, so he just kind of like gave me a massage, and we just chilled out um, in the birth space. And I was straight away having like three surges every ten minutes, lasting um, almost a minute each time. Um, and I was yeah, like quite comfortable through them, but they were more intense straight away than they were with Teddy. So I was kind of like, oh, okay, like this is actually like really happening. And I messaged everyone at like 5.30 in the morning to say, I'm going to need you at some point today, just so you're aware. Um, And then I put my phone away and didn't look at it again. Um, And my friend, who is also a midwife, I have a lot of midwife friends, um, she came over to hang out with Teddy and to provide support like alternating with Josh so they kind of just went about the morning feeding him and playing with him and coming in to give me massages and rub my feet and I just rested like I actively tried to sleep through the most of the day um and same as Teddy's birth my surges just slowed down again so like they went to from three and ten to two and ten to one and ten so by about lunchtime they were kind of stopped like I really wasn't doing much at all and I kind of went oh well, okay, no worries. We'll just go about our day. Yep. So I came out, had yep. some lunch, chilled out with them, watched Teddy play, um, expressed my frustration oh. that I couldn't speed this up, that I had to just wait, that it was going to do what it needed to do, that it could take three days again and I'd have to be okay with that. And again, just let those emotions off my chest. And I was like, yep. I'm feeling agitated. I'm going to go for a walk. It was raining. I didn't care. I still went for a walk. Yep. Um, yep. And we did some gutter walking and just chatted about life and and what was coming and yep. um, just letting it be. And my, my, my best friend was just exactly what I needed at that time. She just listened. Yep. She heard. She validated me. And she said, there is no rush. Nobody is waiting on you. You know, we're here for you and it'll take however long it takes. Nobody needs you to hurry. Um, She made chicken noodle soup for dinner. We ate and then I put my son to bed 
and cried and I knew that it was going to be the last time he went to bed with just me. Oh, that's so sad. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh my gosh. I'd never thought about that for myself. Yeah. So I'm just, oh like, my goodness. ripping open some That's wounds beautiful. for you there. <laughs> oh, that Having almost that, makes me instantly cry. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of feelings that come with that. Like, it almost feels yeah. a little bit like a breakup at some point, um, bringing that oh second baby gosh. into the world. And I just, like, God, I love love them both so much. But in that moment, it felt like so unfair knowing that this would be the last time. And I just held on to him yeah. so tight. I'm like, I love this kid so much. <laughs> he yeah. has no idea what's coming, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and and I think also probably, you know, like um, you and Josh have made this mm. decision to, ha- mm. to bring another child into the world. And mm. like Teddy hasn't really got a say about that so much. And like. That has been know, a running guess- theme <laughs> in the last 18 months. <laughs> you don't get much yeah. of a say in this one, buddy. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Super unfair, but also the best gift you can ever give them. So I just kind of re- reiterated yeah. like one day it won't feel so hard for him and he's gonna love yeah. this and it's gonna be awesome. But certainly there was all the feels about it. So I was just letting myself have yeah. the feels about it. And I slept for an hour next to him. And my friend, I'd made her a bed in the front room, but she decided to leave. She was like, I actually think the best thing I can do is go home because I think yep. she just in tuned that I needed more privacy, that I was not going to progress while anyone else was here. Yep. So um, when she heard that I had fallen asleep, she heard my slow breathing. She just left to let herself out. And an hour later, I woke up straight into it again the surges were strong they were one on top of each other I went out into the lounge room and I was vocalizing and um really intuitively moving like at some point I threw my foot up on the back of the couch and I was in this really deep lunge and I know that baby was like rocketing down at that point um yeah and but in my head I was like it's gonna take forever this is gonna take a while like I'm in it I'm doing it it's labor but don't bother anybody so we didn't call my friend back and we didn't call the midwives and we didn't call the photographer and I hit transition and I said to Josh like fill the pool right now I want to be in it I'm uncomfortable like I just want to relax and he's like do you want to call the midwife yeah. and I'm like do not bother anyone just fill the pool <laughs> and then yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> so again not super logical um in the moment but he trusted me he was yeah, like, that's yeah, fine yeah. so he filled the pool he filled it way too hot way too hot and I got oh, in and I was like ah that's hot man like oh my gosh and he's like I'm so sorry and I'm like you know it's fine it'll be hours yet it'll cool down don't don't yeah. rush and so he was just like wetting my face with a cold washer and giving me cool water and cold grapes and I thought that I was feeling really hot because the water was hot so I was standing up out of the pool cooling myself down between surges and then sinking back into the water during the surge and yeah then I felt nauseous and I thought I was feeling nauseous because the water was hot. So I asked for a vomit bag and I had a sip of water and he's like, Jess, I, I think you're transitioning. And I was like, no, I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) Just get me a cold washer. And he was like, okay, but are you sure you don't want me to call um, the midwives? And I was like, look, like, if you want to call them, if it's going to make you feel better, like, fine, call them advice. So I heard him on the phone and he was just uh, super calm. He tells them, um, you know, Jess is like uh, ready for you to come now. Um, and they said, well, what are her surges doing? And he's like, oh, like they're probably like every five minutes. So they've obviously gone, okay, well, things are progressing, but not like super fast because I was only yeah, doing yeah, two yeah. and ten. He didn't tell them that I'd kind of – started snapping at him or that I was yeah. shivering or that I was hot or that I was nauseous. He didn't tell them any of that. So they yeah. got up, um, had a coffee, had a shower, <laughs> meandered to their car. They live 45 minutes away. And yeah. probably five minutes after their phone call ended, I had the urge to bear down. I had all oh. of this pressure. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God. And Josh is like, don't angry push. Don't try to force it. Just 
you know, it's going to take what time it takes. And I was like, I'm not doing that on purpose. Call them back. Tell them to hurry. <laughs> and yeah, I yeah, did. Yeah. Uh, I reached um, down and and did like an internal. And I di- like, you know, you can't logically think about these things when you're in the middle of transition. So in hindsight, I realized what I was feeling was like an anterior lip. I was nearly fully dilated. My membranes had released because I had membrane in my hand and the head was really low. So I now know that. But at the time, all I said was, um, well, there's still cervix left. So we probably have some time. <laughs> Again, Josh is like everything's fine. This is totally fine. Um, so with the next surge, involuntary bearing down starts, and I feel his head just shoot down. And wow. I was like, oh my god! Like, yeah, no, that that they're not gonna get here. I, they're not coming. <laughs> Yeah. This is fine. Everything's <laughs> fine. So I started barking orders at Josh um, politely as much as I could to yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, turn the fairy lights back on, to um, open the front door, <laughs> to start filming because yeah. they were not going to make gonna it. You're going to miss it? Yeah. And yeah. he was like, he was so obedient. He did all the things. Um, if you ever like go and watch the birth story on my blog, um, you'll see it. You'll see the fairy lights flashing as he's trying to change the the setting. <laughs> um, <laughs> he was just like doing where is, all the things. So, where is Teddy? At, is Teddy asleep or what's yeah, Teddy doing? He was sleeping through the whole thing. Like didn't matter how loud I was. Wow. He was so peacefully asleep and we were just doing our thing. Yeah. And um, I, I, I reached down and could feel this head and I'm slowing myself down and I'm like, not in any way scared. I'm just like, cool, the baby's going to come out faster than I anticipated. No worries. Um, slow down so you don't tear. And I just said to Josh, like, don't be afraid. And he's like, I'm not scared. <laughs> <It's fine. laughs> um, and uh, his head comes out. And this is different to Teddy's because Teddy shot out, remember, from crowning. Yeah, but yeah. when his head came out, I had a gap. I felt him turn, um, which was an odd sensation. And then I slowly birthed him into my hands and slowly brought him up to the water. And I was just like, out of the water. And I was just like, hey, bud, like, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I go, what's the that time? so good. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm a midwife. I needed to know the time of birth. <laughs> yeah, somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and wow. then the first thing after that was, um, I said to Josh, just go wake Teddy up, go get him. He's missing it. Like, so we went and woke him up yeah. and he, when he walked in, Teddy had actually just sat up. It's almost like he knew his brother had been born. He sat up immediately and came out and took off his jammies and jumped in the birth pool with me. Oh, and the video cute. like makes me cry every time Elsie, like I, I, I see it and I see the tears in his eyes as he reaches out to like touch his baby oh. brother and I just oh. lose it every time because it's so tender. Like kids are not afraid oh. of birth at all. He was just like, you did it, mom. And I'm like, oh my God, oh I my did do gosh. it. Like, oh, I'm getting all teary. So, so beautiful. It was so beautiful. That time with just the two of them chilling out in the pool together was just so special. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then everyone yeah. arrived and it was a party. Like my midwives came, my photographer came, my my best friend came back and everyone was like, dude, you had the baby. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so my cool. gosh. Wow. Um, yeah. And what it, what happened with the placenta with Ren Lee? Um, so we had a physiological third stage with Ren, but – as physiology does, when there's a huge disturbance after the birth, it might um, take a bit of time to get back into the swing of things. So it was probably like 25 minutes or so after I'd given birth that everyone yeah. was there and had arrived. And my midwife reminded me, like, Jess, you need to actually choose this. You need to go back into labor now. You need to work on your placenta. You are yeah. excited. Everyone's here. You want to chill and chat um but you actually yeah. need to go back into labor land now and I was like oh yeah. why of course um <laughs> yeah and so the surges were a lot more uncomfortable I was actually feeling them and I didn't with Teddy yeah. and I was like grimacing and I was like fighting it a little bit and I was like once again I need more privacy so they helped me go sit yeah. on the toilet and left me alone or as, as alone as you can with a woman who's got a placenta still inside of her. Um, and I um, 
needed a heat pack on my back because it was really hurting my back. Um, and then, yeah, it took like an hour and 10 minutes to birth the placenta this time, um, yeah. mostly because of that big delay. Um, yeah. The cord was also really short with Renly. Very interesting um, that I had yeah. such short cords, but it wasn't wrapped around me, yeah. so it wasn't a huge issue at all. Um, but, yeah. yeah, the cord was only like 40 centimeters long. It was really quite wow. um, short. And the placenta yep. was fairly small and the yep. came out, um, same deal, very minimal bleeding, um, went and chilled out on the couch. Um, Teddy got to cut the cord, um, oh, which was super so cool. sweet. And he got to examine the placenta with my midwives and oh. he helped his baby brother latch to the breast. Um, oh. Yeah, it was really awesome. Wow, that is so special. I imagine yeah. like – Wow, like there would be like a handful of children like mm. in Australia that have had that experience, you know. Yeah. That's like it, that's all played out that way as well, you know. I would have I I had never thought about that like getting um my first born to like cut his brother's cord but like mm. he was in bed like I had planned that but like mm-hmm. yeah, but like wow. Wow, wow, wow. I hope you have lots of photos of all of that. Yes. So from the time my photographer got there at like um, 12 minutes after birth, um, she took four hours worth of photos and was just, it was so family centered. It is the most incredible series of photos. And she said that it was the most number of photos she'd ever taken for a birth gallery um, in that amount of time for a postpartum. (laughs) Like there was no labor. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Wow. um, Wow. Yeah. So, if anyone is interested, you can go read the full stories and watch that birth video um, on my blog, yeah. um, on my website. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really cool. I'll link it um, in the dis- in the description. But yeah, I um, will definitely check that out after <laughs> we're finished here. I guess I'll get the tissues ready as well. <laughs> oh, that's so beautiful! Wow. Yeah. Wow. So how do you, you know, having had two home birth experiences, like your background, Mm -hmm. um, like how does that make you feel about being a mom, being a woman? Like Mm. how would you describe that, I guess? It is, in my opinion, the single most empowering thing that I will ever experience in my life. Like, yeah you you cannot ever embody that kind of power like it's just like completely me and my body and my baby working together not relying on anybody else it's you know it's sovereign it's it's just incredible and it has shaped how I parent it has shaped every decision we made going forward with you know we're going to homeschool we work from home we are really family centered and it it's everything for us. So it it was the catalyst for the rest of our lives. And yeah. I think it very greatly um impacted my emotional health and well being postpartum to be able to not have to heal from my birth experience while navigating all of those other changes was so important to me. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what more there else is to say just because you've you've number one summed it up. I'm like two like two amazing but very different mm. stories of birthing your two children yeah. at home, like yeah, wow. I'm so passionate about this and so much so that like, you know, last year twenty percent of the clients that I taught changed care provider. Um, yeah. when they realized just how much they could achieve in having a home birth. And I think for so many yeah. people, it's the the doubt, can I not do it? Am I not strong enough? What if the pain's too much for me? What if something goes wrong? Those are the things that stop them from going down that route for a home birth, especially for their first baby. But, you know, your first birth is not a trial run. You do not have to prove that you can. Because you no. will. And yeah. why would you set yourself up to do it in the most difficult circumstances? Like, why not do it at home? If there's no medical need to be in a medical facility, then stay at home. 
and have your baby yeah. where you conceive them. Well, most likely. Yeah. And then cuddle back <laughs> in bed and, you know, continue on yeah. from there. Like I feel very passionate about that. It's not right for everybody, yeah. but it's certainly right for more than 1% of the population. So. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The statistics are atrocious. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, and I think that's, um, yeah, I, I think I've mentioned it in another episode as well. Like I I love hearing um, people's uh, birth at home stories and um, I, you know, I'm working on Instagram and like trying to, you know, get the word out there that mm. my podcast exists. <laughs> um, but like trying to, yeah, I use the word infiltrate. I know it's not a very nice word, but infiltrate, like the other areas of society that don't know home birth exists, Mm. that don't know anything about home birth, that have really negative preconceived um, non-evidence-based ideas about home birth. Like I'm trying, Mm. I'm trying to get the word out there to them because they need, they are the ones that need to hear these stories. And um, like, I love listening to birth stories. I love watching birth videos, but you know, I've had two home births. You've had two home births. Like, Mm. Um, we're not the ones that need them the most. It's the it's the people out there that just yeah, like, you're so right. Th- don't know how amazing it can be. Yeah, that's what I'm all about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too, me too. Well, if you're listening and you know someone that's pregnant, um, know someone that might be pregnant because like part part of this as well is that you know most women mm. don't start looking into birth options until mm. they're actually pregnant. Yeah. And 42 weeks or however long you're pregnant for it might seem like a long time and you might think that you have like a lot of time to like, you know, yeah. look into it, but it actually it's not a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and when you, yeah, especially if you've, you know, got other children or other responsibilities, like, mm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe I, I mean, should like, like by the get time the podcast. I start working with people, it's usually halfway through their pregnancy or more. Yeah. And then you have to undo the preconceived notions first before you yeah. build the foundation. And like that's what I'm all about is like building that foundation. But yeah, yeah, the more we can get this out there, the more people that are telling their stories to their friends and really embodying positive birth, the more people will have the opportunity to know their options before they get to the end of their pregnancy Um, and it's all about changing our birth culture one birth at a time but ideally we want to do that faster (laughs) because everybody deserves to have this kind of experience um yeah yeah I I'm really passionate about being able to to offer that and to be able to share what I know and to help people step into their births feeling really confident and trusting their body and having a skill set and also empowering their partners to have the same it's yeah equally yeah. as important that the birth partners aren't afraid that they are confident that they know how to provide that support so that when she looks up for that reassurance or for that um support that it's there you know yeah because she shouldn't yeah. have to be supporting her team while she's birthing either no 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 <laughs> yeah you've yeah you've summed it up that's beautiful um yeah I mean we could talk for hours I know yeah but do stop me because I know you have a time (laughs) thank you so so much for joining me on uh the birthing at home a podcast Jess um I'm really grateful that you've shared these stories with us and I really hope that um you know it lights something up in somebody's brain that might be listening that might be pregnant that might never have considered home birth before thank you for having me Elsie